So let's uh, launch our advocate and donor duos. It's my honor to introduce Jeffrey Winder, the Senior Manager for Racial and Economic Justice at the Gay Straight Alliance Network, and Ryan Pedlow, Chairman of the Board of the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Winder, and as Tim said, I'm the Senior Manager for Racial and Economic Justice Programs at Gay Straight Alliance Network. GSA Network is a youth leadership organization whose vision for full equality um, and social who has a vision for full equality and social justice for all LGBT people. And I'm very honored uh, and a little nervous uh, to be here today to talk about an organization that um, I consider to have raised me and whose story is highly instrumental in my own development as an activist, a leader, and as a queer man of color. I came out 15, at the age of 15 and started my school's GSA club in a small town called Davis, California in 1998. That was the same year that GSA Network was founded in California with 40 GSA clubs. Currently in California, we operate a network of 940 clubs. My first mentor I met, um, and some of you also know her, her name is Carolyn Laub, uh, who's the founder and executive director of GSA Network at a conference in 1999 when she was a 25-year-old ED and I was a wily, bright-eyed, queer youth. Um, and what she had said then, and still says now, about building the power of, of GSA clubs and networking them together made a lot of sense to me. I was a very young, angry young person uh, and a person who fought his bullies. Um, I often ditched school and my mom ended up calling the school every day for the last two years to make sure that I was going or to see if I was being truant. However, I did find a sense of purpose in running my GSA club, and I would show up to school in order to fulfill my GSA obligations. GSA Network honed that sense of purpose for me and gave me a larger one than my, just my school community uh, and a sense of obligation to the larger queer youth community. It was, at, it was at GSA Network that my identity as a multiracial person of color was validated as a source of pride and power through working with queer folks of color on GSA Network's adult advisory board. GSA Network taught me to see the world for what it was and empowered me with the tools to cha challenge and change it. Here I am 15 years later, and GSA Network is a national organization that empowers youth across this country to build the GSA movement. Today, there are an estimated 4,000 GSAs nationwide, 3,000 of which are supported by one of 37 state-based GSA networks that GSA Network and the national organizations help support and coordinate. We also continue to operate the California GSA Network, in which we've been at the forefront of LGBT schools policy in, with, with laws such as Harvey Milk Day and the Fair Education Act. We're a majority queer youth of color grassroots organization whose miss mission and principles are centered on the lived experiences of those most vulnerable in our community. And through, it is through this lens that our vision of LGBT youth success is far broader and more expansive than just school safety for LGBT youth. LGBT youth issues are the same issues facing all youth across this country. According to our friends at the Williams Institute, LGBT youth are six to seven percent of the youth population, while only three to four percent of the adult population. And by 2023, the majority of young people in this country will be young people of color. The Safe Schools Movement has, primar has primarily focused on the experiences of bullying, harassment, and discrimination of LGBT youth in schools. Our youth are being relentlessly bullied, bullied to death, committing suicide, skipping, or dropping out, or being forced out of school, and facing family rejection, many ending up homeless. However, young people, our young people, our youth, are also resilient and thriving and becoming leaders of their own social change. Today, we are increasingly concerned not only about the bullying, which is pervasive in our schools, but also the climate of our schools is such that many of them look less like institutions of education and more like institutions of incarceration. To us, we think that this is also an LGBT youth issue. And so we are combating the policies and practices that push youth of color, youth with disabilities, as well as LGBTQ youth out of schools and towards prison, or that make schools more like prisons themselves, a concept coined by youth of color known as the school to prison pipeline. GSA Network focuses on intersectional policy issues that are needed for youth success, such as fighting overly strict anti-bullying policies that often more harshly punish LGBT youth uh, and youth of color, or other school policies in which teachers or administrators own homophobia can lead to more harsh discipline or criminalization of LGBT youth mental health access for LGBT youth, the issues of guns and violence on campus, and the overly harsh profiling and treatment of queer youth by police are all LGBT youth issues. 
I currently oversee GSA Network's racial and economic justice programs, which builds national and state-based intersectional cross-movement collaborations to address the needs of low-income queer youth of color. For example, we recently worked with the Alliance for Educational Justice, another grassroots youth-led organization, uh, to produce a white paper shifting the narrative around anti-bullying efforts away from harsh punitive policies towards ones that are restorative and address the root causes of homophobia and bullying. Running my GSA club and working at GSA Network, I always understood my GSA to be part of a larger social justice struggle. At GSA Network, we continue to expand on the vision that Carolyn Laub shared with a young Jeffrey, wherein GSA clubs are vehicles for social change and LGBT youth leaders drive broader social justice. Thus, our work with GSAs and LGBT youth empowerment is training the next generation of LGBT leaders. This is a very exciting time to be doing LGBT youth work. I stand here today, 15 years later, working for an organization that raised me uh, to be an LGBTQ leader at a time when queer youth are in a time of social and political ascension and leadership. You'll hear today uh, from the rest of the panel from LGBT youth and LGBT youth of color who are leaders in many other social movements happening today, from the dreamers to the fight for reproductive rights to those now we, that we work closely with in the movement for education reform. LGBTQ youth are at the forefront. Leaders are already in their own rights on issues that are important to them because they live in the 21st century in which these issues are, are all issues of great importance to the LGBT community. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your great work. I've been asked to discuss school climate as a donor and as chairman of the board of directors at GLSEN. Why do I give to this area and why to GLSEN? I'll share a little bit about my background and why this issue speaks to me. I grew up in a rural area and until about grade 10, I was able to fit in pretty much. And then my interests diverged from my peers in one way in particular and I was pretty much found out. And at that point, the bullying started and it got really bad. The worst moment that I remember is when I went out to my car to drive home from school and using a dead fish was the words fag smeared across my windshield. I quickly cleaned it off as fast as I could and tried to drive home. But when I pulled up to a stoplight, they came up behind me and tried to push my car into oncoming traffic. Fortunately, I was okay and I had an escape route. I became an exchange student and I went to Australia. And after that, you know, everything was okay. But, you know, this isn't an option for most students. And that's why I really want to help improve school climate. If I had one wish, it would be to make schools safer so LGBT students could thrive and pursue their dreams and we could become the most productive members of society with, other, with whatever we chose to do with our lives. But this is not a reality for most. GLSEN's latest school climate survey showed that over 30% of LGBT students skipped at least one day of school in the last month because they didn't feel safe going. It's hard to graduate at the top of your class if you're too scared to go to school. So why GLSEN? My first introduction to GLSEN came at Outgiving in 2007. I wanted to support an organization with scale and impact. GLSEN impacts school climate in many ways. Through supporting over 7,000 GSAs, through teacher and principal trainings across the country, and through putting a safe space kit in every school. And this includes a sticker that a teacher will put up so that students can find a safe space in that school, whether it's lunch hour or whenever they were being bullied, they have somewhere that they can go and be safe. And access to a supportive teacher in the school is one of the most important factors for LGBT students' well-being. Thanks to many people in this room, and especially GLSEN's founder, Kevin Jennings, and our executive director, Eliza Byard, the fact is, GLSEN has transformed the place of LGBT issues in education for over two decades. But much is left to be done, domestically, especially in rural areas, and also internationally. In many ways, school climate is getting better, 
but there's also many challenges. Because of the media attention and our attention right now to gay issues being front and center, the average LGBT student comes out at the age of 13, or they're dragged out of the closet because this is such a front of mind issue for a lot of people. It's harder to hide. And that leaves many more years of bullying in high school, potentially. As a donor, one of the real advantages to giving to school climate is that it's very cost efficient because most of the work is carried out by teacher and student volunteers. However, a lot of investment is needed. Those safe space kits, for example, cost $20 each, but you have to scale them across 100,000 schools. So something like that is $2 million. Another reason for us to support school climate is that today's students really are our future. Bullies in schools become bullies in the workplace. And straight allies in schools can become allies for life. We really can transform, genera we really can transform attitudes for generations to come. And these studies show that support of schools can lead to support for marriage equality and other LGBT issues. Students have an influence on their parents. There's many ways we can help. Of course, we've been, we can become major donors, we can join boards, but also school climate is a great way to get employers and corporations involved in the LGBT movement. Because anti-bullying is really not controversial and it's not really a political topic. So it's very easy for corporations to support. We'll be hosting a school climate table at breakfast tomorrow or please find me at any time during this conference, and I'm happy to talk more about school climate and about GLSEN. Thank you. Here to discuss youth homelessness, please welcome Jameis Shelton, 40 to None Project, and donor Terrence Meck from the Pallet Fund. to join the True Colors Fund as the director of the 40 to None Project, which is the first national organization dedicated solely to ending LGBT youth homelessness. Approximately 40% of youth experiencing homelessness in our country are LGBT identified. So that's roughly 640,000 of the estimated 1.6 million youth experiencing homelessness in our country. The most commonly cited factor for their homelessness is family rejection. As someone who has worked day to day with these young people for the past nine years, I truly understand the issues they face and I understand the need for a national platform to address this issue. Once homeless, LGBT youth are more likely than their straight counterparts to experience victimization, abuse substances, and engage in high risk sexual behavior. They're navigating the rocky terrain between adolescence and adulthood with little support and no safety net. While the reality for many homeless LGBT youth is bleak, there are some, though still quite a too few, service providers that are working to meet their basic needs in cities across the country. The True Colors Fund is dedicated to not only supporting these young people and having their basic needs met, but actually ending LGBT youth homelessness. And we recognize that's a really tall order, but I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna do it. We've established a three-tiered approach for ending LGBT youth homelessness, and I'm gonna tell you about it by talking about a young person that I've worked with. So I met Angel when she was 17. Her mother kicked her out when she came out as transgender. She said she couldn't allow Angel to
agencies across the country to identify and disseminate best practices for supporting families and ending LGBT youth homelessness. It's also important, though, to recognize that family reunification will not always be an option. Often there are other issues happening in the home, and sometimes being out of the home is the only safe and viable option for young people. Angel, like other young people that can't return home, moved between shelters and transitional living programs for the next few years. She didn't stay at some for long because she didn't feel safe or affirmed in her identity. She did finish high school. She tried to maintain a job and save money to live on her own. That can take a really long time, even for people who have unconditional family support. So the third tier, affirming ongoing services. Some young people are going to need support and assistance to make it through the transition from adolescence to adulthood. The majority of young people in the country do not have access to LGBT-specific shelter programs. Based on our research with the Paulette Fund and the Williams Institute, we know that 76% of homeless LGBT youth are actually accessing mainstream shelter services. So it's imperative that all programs know how to work with all youth. The 40 to None project is developing an inclusive system of training and accountability, as well as engaging in legislative advocacy and partnering with HUD and HHS to ensure that agencies across the country are trained, assessed, ranked, and held accountable for providing competent services to all young people. Five years after I met her, Angel got the keys to her own supportive housing apartment in New York City. Though the journey took some time, Angel's story has a successful ending. There are over half a million others like her that need our help. And I'm gonna say that one more time. There are over half a million others like Angel that need our help. On a more personal note, I've spent my entire career working with LGBT youth experiencing homelessness and I could talk about it all day long. So please find me if you would like to talk about it more. I believe we're truly at a turning point we can improve their lives and we can improve the conditions that often force them out of their homes. I have hope. Our founder, Cindy Lauper, would have liked to be here today, but this is the opening weekend of her Broadway show, Kinky Boots. But she is here in spirit and actually also on video. Hi, all you outgivers, it's me, Cindy. I'm so sorry I can't be there with you. I am so glad Jama is there today to tell you about the impact that homelessness is having on the LGBT youth. I want you to know that the True Colors Fund and the 40 to None Project will not stop until the 40% is none. And I'm thrilled to introduce Terrence Mack from the Paulette Fund, who has been a great friend and ally to us. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy Lauper. Wow. <laughs> it's in my writer now that I could only be introduced by Cindy. <laughs> and thank you, Jema, for all the amazing work um, you have done and are now doing at 40 to None. We are so excited to see what's going to happen. Uh, when I started the Paulette Fund five years ago as a very new donor and um, a first-time out, first outgiver uh, in 2009, I went on an early site visit um, to a group in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I walked into, as anyone who's done these side visits know, it's a youth group, it's in the basement of um, an old rundown church in Springfield, which is not a very gay-friendly town at all. And I walk into this room, there's 20 youth at the table, and they're all wearing buttons that say, fuck marriage. And uh, <laughs> Evan Wilson just had a minor heart attack in the back. <laughs> I have an extra if you want one. The, um, <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. All jokes aside, the, um, you know, it was very powerful and it was extremely eye-opening to me. Uh, I asked these youth, um, half of them, uh, half of which were trans, uh, you know, what's up with these buttons? And they said that they, marriage was not an issue for them. It wasn't something that they were even thinking about. They didn't know where they were gonna sleep that night. They didn't know where their next meal was. They didn't know, you know what their life was going to be in 24 hours, let alone where they're going to be at the age when they could actually think about getting married. Um, and it was really a turning point for me and, and for the foundation and the work that we were doing. 
Um, it was soon after that uh, that I met Gregory Lewis, who is the executive director of Cindy's True Colors Fund, which Jema was talking about. And we spoke about joining forces um, to create a national voice for homeless youth, um, LGBT homeless youth in this country, because it just does not exist. There's no organization nationally that's looking at this um, in a specific way, and uh, we really felt the need to start tackling that issue. Our first grant with the True Colors Fund um, enabled us to conduct a full landscape of LG LGBT homeless youth services throughout the country. Gregory and I got on planes, trains, and many different automobiles, went to uh, 10 different cities, did over 50 site visits, meeting with homeless youth service providers and really getting a sense of what was happening throughout the country and what wasn't. Um, we followed up this grant with a grant to the Williams Institute, uh, which Jema spoke about, as did Brad earlier, um, to enable the first survey uh, to be done of all of the youth services organizations doing this work throughout the country. Um, after that, and the results of this survey, which was called Serving Our Youth, along with the knowledge we gathered through our various site visits and continued meetings, um, we really saw the clear necessity for a national organization focusing on this. There was a clear missing voice, um, and the youth voice was the missing voice. They did not have any platform to get their issues out there. That was their issue with marriage. Everyone was talking about it. They could not get their voice heard. Um, so with that, uh, Gregory and the True Colors Fund, um, with the help of Platform and some others, was able to launch the 40 to None project, um, and that was in the summer of 2012. Moving forward, we then used all of the stuff that we had worked with, um, the results of this survey, all of the knowledge we got from our site visits, uh, and we went to the federal government um, to speak with them to ensure that LGBT youth were included in the upcoming point in time count. For those that don't know, the point in time count is when they go to the streets and actually count the homeless people um, throughout the country. They have never done that, including youth, before. Uh, and this brings me to an extremely important fourth tier to add to Jema's other three, uh, and that is public and private partnerships, which I cannot stress enough, and I think Kate was talking about this as well earlier, the importance of these partnerships and the importance of us infiltrating these um, institutions within the government are so critically important uh, to making a difference in so many issues, especially youth homelessness. And as Jema touched on, we're thrilled to report that in January of this year, for the first time ever, sexual orientation and gender identity questions were included in a nine-city pilot program counting homeless youth. This was only made possible due to our collaboration with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the Department of Education. And getting all four of these institutions in one room with uh, with the right people and the right uh, other donors at the table was not easy, um, but it really, really paid off. Uh, and it was an amazing first step in combating this issue on a national level for the first time. Um, and thanks to many people and foundations in this room, we also raised enough money to ensure that a cross-site evaluation from this pilot program is performed that will include extremely important statistics on sexual orientation and gender identity relating to the youth population. That's actually happening right now, and we'll hopefully have the results of this um, in the coming months. And because of this, uh, we really have no doubt that sexual orientation and gender identity will continue to be a key element in this extremely important federal program and many more programs in the future. Um, our current grant with True Colors Fund is a three-year grant, a capacity building grant, um, so they were able to hire Jema, uh, and I am so thrilled uh, to be able to provide this because I have no doubt that uh, things are going to be unbelievable um, as we finally give a, youth, a voice to these youth. Um, and when we do win marriage, and when that battle is fought and won, and it will be, um, there are still so many homeless youth on our streets every day. Uh, and I, you know, Chad mentioned this earlier in his talk. I have a big fear of what's going to happen when we do win marriage. Um, I really am scared that a lot not only a lot of the money is gonna disappear, because there's a lot of people that are gonna think that our battles are done and that we have all of the protections we need, um, but there's gonna be a lot of people not helping out on the streets um, and on the ground, which is where this work really needs to happen. Um, you know, the fight is definitely not going to be over. We all have had some sort of fear in our life at some point uh, before coming out that we were gonna get kicked to the curb and end up on the street ourselves. Um, we have been all very fortunate in our lives to be sitting in this room tonight, and there are so many thousands and thousands of youth out there who are not, and they need our help. So thank you. <laughs>
To discuss healthcare access for all, please welcome activists and advocate Jace Woodrum and Jennifer Cates from the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. I'm just going to wait for Cindy. Many of us don't think much about health care until we get those test results or we're given our prognosis. Or until we realize after years of struggle and questions that we're transgender. Or until we're turned away from care because of who we are, who we love, how we look, or how much money we have. Many of us just don't think much about health care until it's all we can think about. Until that moment when suddenly, sometimes unexpectedly, health care becomes a top priority in our lives. That's exactly what happened to me. I thought very, very little about health care beyond that little card in my wallet. Until all my years of searching led me to find authenticity as a transgender man. Then suddenly, what was once an afterthought became all I could think about. How would I find doctors who would understand me? How would I gain access to hormone therapy? How would I ever find the dollars I needed for surgery? It seemed impossible for me to transition and become the person I was meant to be, and it was the most terrifying time of my life. The healthcare system was too complicated, too frightening, and too much for me to tackle. Although I was able to transition and live authentically, it wasn't easy to face all the doctors, to jump through all the hoops, and to spend all of my energy convincing people I deserved the care I knew I needed, the care I knew I needed since I was a little kid. My story is not unique, sadly, and it's not confined only to transgender people. LGBT people from all walks of life face unique disparities in healthcare. In 2010, healthcare was the third priority identified for LGBT Coloradans, 4,600 of whom were surveyed by One Colorado, the state's leading LGBT advocacy organization. Healthcare was so important to the community, in fact, that we made it a top priority for One Colorado. And we began with a study of the health needs and beliefs and experiences of LGBT people. And through that study, we exposed two critical issues facing the community. The first, access to care. A shocking 21% of LGBT Coloradans and 53% of transgender Coloradans have been refused care simply because of who they are. That's more than one in five of all respondents, more than half of transgender respondents denied, turned away, refused care by a doctor or a health facility. The second issue we uncovered in our health study is quality of care. Because of the discrimination that LGBT people experience, only 59% of LGBT Coloradans feel safe enough to be very open with their health providers about their sexual orientation and gender identity. It's the person we trust enough to examine our bodies and treat us, but we cannot be honest about ourselves. Access to quality care. Shouldn't it be a basic fundamental right for all of us? But LGBT people, and especially transgender people, know it isn't. Not yet. But we're getting there. And it's happening faster than you might expect. To be sure, the Affordable Care Act changed health care in this country. And although much remains to be seen about how it will impact us fully, we know this to be true. It's likely to dramatically improve the lives of LGBT people. The effects of the Affordable Care Act are already trickling down and touching and impacting the lives of millions. In Colorado, we're using the opportunity presented by the Affordable Care Act to make state-level advances. We've been working first with a division of insurance to interpret our non-discrimination policies in our own state and in the Affordable Care Act to ensure that transgender people are provided the care they need. And I'm absolutely thrilled to tell you that that initiative was recently quite successful. 
We've also been working with the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative and other partners who know a lot more about healthcare than we do, thank goodness, and we've been advocating to expand Medicaid. That too is looking quite promising. And lastly, we've been working with the Colorado Medical Society, and I'll tell you, they're not the most progressive organization. But we've been working with them to study doctors' attitudes about LGBT people so we can begin to improve the care that people get, so we can begin to improve the experiences that people have when they walk into a hospital, a health facility, and they sit down and talk with a doctor. Without a doubt, I know the healthcare system is complex and challenging and frustrating, but we are at an incredibly rare moment a window of opportunity has opened, and we must do all we can to seize this opportunity, to improve the lives of LGBT people so we can live and thrive all in good health. Thank you. Well, as a first-time first outgiver or outgiving virgin, I want to thank uh, the Gill Foundation and Tim Sweeney in particular for the opportunity to be here. And I also want to thank Jace for his inspiration and passion and the difference that he's helped to make on expanding healthcare access. For me, it's quite an honor to be able to be here and talk about healthcare access in the LGBT community as part of the theme, Healthcare Access for All. It's an issue I've been working on for my whole career. It's the focus of the work at the Kaiser Family Foundation. And we are, as Jace said, at such an important moment. We're closer to realizing this, vi this vision than ever before for two critical reasons. First, as we heard, we're in the midst of the biggest expansion of health coverage in the US in more than 40 years with the Affordable Care Act. Second, there are tremendous new opportunities and steps forward for LGBT health, including for people with HIV in our community due to the ACA and related developments. And therefore, we're closer to being able to end LGBT health disparities than we have been, though this work requires a lot of effort, particularly at the implementation level. So to highlight just a few of these changes, and there are many. The ACA includes, among other things, non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and health status, including HIV status, and health plan coverage, access, and benefits. This means that employers, insurers, providers, in, for example, the state healthcare marketplaces, the exchanges that we're all hearing about, can't discriminate. In some states, same-sex couples can enroll in family coverage. And people who have pre-existing conditions, such as HIV, will no longer be excluded from coverage. These are huge steps forward. In addition, the ACA ends annual lifetime caps on coverage, which, as we know, have made care unaffordable for a lot of us who have expensive care. Benefits. Specifically, the ACA includes categories of benefits that are essential, things like prescription drugs and mental health services that we know are so important for the first time makes them essential health benefits. Medicaid expansion, as we heard. We know from all of the data this morning that many in our community are low income and need programs like Medicaid but have often been unable to become eligible because although they're poor, they don't meet the categories that Medicaid requires. The ACA changes this, and states can expand to cover anyone who's poor, or virtually anyone who's poor. As you might know, though, the Supreme Court has made this a bit tenuous, and the work that Jace is talking about that needs to take place at every state level is so critical. And that's really the lesson and the main thing about the ACA in general. It's the law, we have the law, but implementing it is really where we're at. So it's a key moment in this country and for LGBT people, including those with HIV, to seize that potential. So let me turn to, to HIV specifically for a minute. Um, I want to show this, uh, oh, it's already there, great. President Obama, in December 2011, speaking at an event where he talked about the end of AIDS. And why is this significant? For the first time, the science is telling us that if we implement, it sounds like the ACA, if we implement the tools we have, we can turn the tide of this epidemic. Specifically, there's powerful new data that shows that antiretrovirals, which we know have kept so many people with HIV alive for so much longer, can also help reduce transmission to an uninfected partner by 96% by suppressing the virus. This is what prompted President Obama and others to say we can achieve an AIDS-free generation if we implement these tools, something none of us, I certainly didn't expect to be saying that just a few years ago, that we can end this. But to do so, we need to dramatically expand coverage and access. Just one third of people with HIV in the US are on treatment now.
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really humbled to be here, um, to be able to share uh, my story, my narrative. Um, I just wanted to say, outgiving is really fancy. I feel like I'm here, I feel like I'm at the American Music Awards and I'm gonna present, um, uh, you know, um, an award to Shakira or Ricky Martin. Um, <laughs> but that's not what I'm here for. Um, um, I'm here to really show um, and express through my story um, that immigrant rights are LGBT rights. And I wanna start with, um, as an immigrant youth movement, um, one of our foundations of the organizing and advocacy work that we do has been storytelling. Um, and so I wanna share with you my first coming out story. Um, and that was when I was 15 years old um, and I was getting off work. I started working when I was 14 years old. Um, um, my family's very you know, hardworking. We really value hard work. And my mom was a single mother um, trying to um, raise five children. So I figured that a way to help her out was to start a part-time job when I was 14. Um, and so it was a Saturday evening. She picked me up. I think I was working at a pizza joint. Um, and um, we, were, we were coming to a red light. And I clearly remember all of this. And it was on 17th Street and Main Street um, in Santa Ana in Orange County, California. Um, and it was one of those moments where you feel something's coming at you. Um, everything became really serious. We had uh, Spanish music on in the radio. Um, in the car, she turned it off. Very dramatic, um, um, you know, um, like a Mexican soap opera. And, and so, but I think, you know, as Mexicans, we're, we're dramatic and it's in, it's in our blood. Um, and so she turns over to me and, and asks me, ¿Te gustan los niños o las niñas? Um, do you like boys or girls? Um, well, Back then, I like boys, now I like men. <laughs> and so um, um, she, you know, um, and so, you know, um, I thought about lying and not being true to myself only because, um, you know, when I was six years old, my father had figured out that I was different, um, whatever that meant to him. And so ever since then, he, he had rejected me. And when I, when I turned uh, 10, he decided to leave the family and not be part of our lives. And so, but then, you know, I was like, no, as long as I stay true to myself, everything will be okay. And so I tell her, me gustan los niños, I like boys. And then the, the light finally turned green. She um, parks in the nearest parking lot, tells me to get off. And, and I was like, oh God, you know, here I am. I'm in my uniform. I'm going to get this zone. This is not cute. Um, but everything's going to be okay. Um, and so she gets off the car as well, you know, turns around the car. And there's tears in her eyes, and she tells me, I'm your mother, and the only thing I can do is love you and protect you. Um, so this is a mother who is a, has only a second-grade education, an undocumented woman um, who I love. Um, and the work that I take a lot of a great responsibility in the work that I do for the love and acceptance my family has given me since I came out to them. Um, and so that really speaks you know, to the increasing support that we're getting in the Latino community for LGBT rights. Um, I myself, I'm queer and undocumented. Um, I am part of, um, I'm the project coordinator for the Queer and Undocumented Im Immigrant Project, a project of United We Dream. We are the largest immigrant youth network in this country with um, 57 affiliates in over 25 states in this country. Um, and so, um, you know, we launched this program, you know, last year and there's been a lot of challenges in how do we do this work. Um, but for us, we understand the intersection of our lives. And I'm taking back to Audrey Lorde's work, uh, where she mentions that we as individuals do not lead single issue lives. So why do we continue to lead single issue campaigns and advocacy efforts? Um, we're at a point, um, we're in this historical political moment, and I feel that the LGBTQ and immigrant rights movements are at the forefront of that. So we gotta figure out ways to really work together uh, and make sure, right, as I do this work every day, um, I am fearful that at any moment, at any day, I, get, I will get a call from my family members or my friends telling me that my mother was stopped by a police officer because her, she had a broken tail light on her car and that upon the police officer finding out she's undocumented, she was turned over to uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement and that now she's in a deportation proceeding. That's a real fear that I carry with me every single day of my life. And there's 11 million undocumented people in this country who do not have the opportunity to apply for a work permit, to have a driver's license, to have a government-issued ID, to have uh, workers' protection rights. And these are issues that affect our LGBT community. The Williams Institute just came out with a number that says that over a quarter of a million of undocumented people are LGBT people. And so what happens to these brothers and sisters once they're detained? They undergo physical and sexual abuse in detention centers. 
And these are the issues that we want to bring forth um, um, to this narrative that very much complicates the narrative and makes the work that much more challenging. Um, but this work needs to be, uh, it, it cannot be about transactional. It cannot be, what can I get from you? What can you get from me? This needs to be about transformational organizing and advocacy. How do we change each other so that we treat each other with love and respect? And so I want to leave with two things um, for all of you, and we're more happy. My colleague and ally Alejandra is here with me. We'll be part of a roundtable tomorrow, and we're happy to address these issues in a more deep uh, and thorough way. But I leave with two things. Um, and as a person who's definitely, of course, of color, obviously, um, undocumented and immigrant, um, there's always been a process that up until lately I had to negotiate before I walked into an LGBT space. And I told myself, okay, today I'm only, I'm only queer. And there was another negotiation that I was happening when I walked into immigrant rights spaces where, okay, today I'm only undocumented. But that needed to stop. It was a disservice that I was doing to social justice in this country. And so I leave with two things um, for us to consider as we do this work. One, that those most affected need to be at the forefront of organizing and advocacy. And those are the people that need to be here in this room, right? And as you can see, all of us in this room are white folks, right? And so how do we bring you know, LGBT immigrants, LGBT people of color into, this, into these conversations? And two, um, I just want to leave with saying that as we move this work forward, to really deeply understand um, that um, immigrant rights, LGBT rights, and the LGBT rights are immigrant rights, and that we as United We Dream are committed to empowering, organizing, and mobilizing LGBT undocumented people, LGBT immigrant youth in this country to ensure that we're building these alliances between both movements. Thank you so much, Jorge, and it's, it's leaders like Jorge that have transformed the immigrant rights movement with dreamers, mainly LGBT dreamers at the front, so I can't begin to thank you enough for that transformation. I do want to say that at my job, every day I feel very grateful to have Tim Sweeney's old job. <laughs> Unfortunately, every day I realize and am told on a daily basis that I am not as nice as, not as smart as, not as cute as, not as strategic as that damn sainted Tim Sweeney. So uh, I really pity whoever's going to be filling his big shoes at the Gill Foundation. And I'll look forward to commiserating with that person. Uh, I really am proud to work at the Haas Jr. Fund. Uh, it was the first foundation, gay or straight, to embrace marriage equality as a priority funding issue, and that was 12 years ago. And this year, we celebrate three important milestones. First, it's our 60th anniversary of being founded by Walter A. Haas, Jr. and his wife, Evelyn. Walter was the great-great-nephew of Levi Strauss, the jeans man. Uh, let me just say, Levi, uh, that he never got married, he never had any children, and we have 501 genes. And I think you all can do the math. Uh, second milestone is that we are finishing our 10, year, our 10 years of investment in immigrant rights. And our third milestone that we crossed just last week was $100 million in grant making to support gay equality and immigrant rights. Yeah. I sometimes wish I was the great, great, great grandnephew of Levi Strauss, uh, but that's another matter. Uh, why did our trustees embrace these causes when they literally were the third rail of politics and the culture wars? Uh, I can say it wasn't because any of our trustees are, ch are their children are gay on the gay side, and their immigrants, Im immigration story was several generations back. I can say on the gay side, it was actually the pure persuasive power of Evan Wilson and Tim Sweeney who pitched the idea of marriage equality to our fund. 
And on the immigration side, I've learned that it was the love that our founder had for immigrant workers in Levi Strauss and company factories that he transmitted to his children. But on both fronts, more than anything else, it, and what drove them then and what drives our trustees now, is a recognition of the profound injustices that these communities face and a real desire to make change. Now, Kate said a few minutes ago, and I get the same question all the time, why is immigration reform a gay issue? I think you can come at it from two very different directions and come up with the same conclusion. Uh, the first is that, yes, gay people are everywhere, and that every injustice and every problem in this country is going to impact and affect gay people. But there are some issues, and we've been hearing from, about them today and just before I got up here, like HIV, like bullying, like employment discrimination, that are gay issues because they disproportionately hurt LGBT people. And immigration is one of those issues. As Jorge was talking about, across the board, this horrible, broken, inhuman immigration system, if it's not even a system, in things like detention, asylum, workplace exploitation, you name it, across all the broken pieces of this system, hits our people, that 267,000 undocumented LGBT adults, not counting children, our people, it hits them with disproportionate harm, disproportionate terror, disproportionate violence, simply because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. But I have a lot of friends who say, you know, that doesn't resonate with me. I don't, you know, we could make every issue a gay issue. And, and I say to them, well, let's do p pure political pragmatism, and that's something that Kate talked about earlier. We know that immigrants and their families, are, their power is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that power was so vividly demonstrated in November that even the GOP now has come to the table about reform. And we, an LGBT community, have this specific moment in time. And it is this moment in time, in fact, when the House and Senate bills are introduced in the next couple of weeks, we can step up and play a meaningful role in helping get meaningful, comprehensive, humane immigration reform over the finish line. And if we do that, we are going to have powerful partners to help us address the, the things we heard about just a little bit ago, the fact that we're not able to move legislation in Congress right now, the fact that we have 29 states with no civil rights protections for gay people, 34 states with no civil rights protections for trans people. We need this ally, this allied community, to help us get over uh, those challenges. Or, you know, we could choose to be silent, or worse, I believe, worse, we could be in this only for the purely gay issue that a lot of people see, and that's the issue of binational couples and threaten to walk out of the process if that isn't taken care of right away, or start using language like we're the only ones being thrown under the bus, let me tell you, a lot of people are gonna be harmed in this process, and the bill is, not, is gonna end up harming a lot of people as well. If we do that, we are gonna blow this historic opportunity that we have right now, and it will take us years and years to get over that. The good thing is there are, li there are literally dozens of ways, and they're in your uh, what did Kate say, uh, Kate Clinton, the Gil porn book, uh, brain porn, sorry, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the Gil Foundation should put out a porn book, I think you could, that should be Tim Sweeney's parting gift. Uh, there are literally, literally dozens of ways that donors can become involved, from the completely edgy and controversial to the completely non-controversial. And I'm just going to give you three right here. Uh, here's a program uh, that is being run by the Liberty Hill Foundation in Los Angeles, thanks to the generosity of 40 different gay organizations and leaders. It's helping dreamers 
the people that Jorge works so hard for pay the $465 in fees that are required to apply for uh, deferred deportation and work permits under the president's new policy. It's already helped 200 LGBT dreamers, and it sent a really powerful message to the larger reform effort. Another is the Four Freedoms Fund, that it pools money from individuals and foundations to promote voter engagement, voter education, and voter registration. C3 work. A lot of people think what happened in November, the, the outpouring and the strength of the immigrant vote just came from nowhere. Actually, it was built up over the last five years by very strategic C3 investments by the Four Freedoms Fund. And the last example, the New Americans campaign, this is mom and apple pie, is another collaborator that's working to streamline and help the eight million legal permanent residents here become and take the step towards citizenship, which leads to voting, which leads to voting for our, in our alliances for LGBT people. So I can assure you that from whatever perspective you come from, there is a place for you in the immigration reform movement, and Jorge and Alejandra and, Ma and I would be honored to talk to you about it. Thank you very much. To discuss aging, please welcome to the stage Dr. Kathleen Sullivan from the LA Gay and Lesbian Center and Ambassador Jim Hormel. So great to be here with all of you. When I talk to people about LGBT aging, I usually start just by reminding them who we're talking about. These folks are the shopkeepers, the lawyers, the mothers, the fathers, the people who helped build this community through their activism. Some of them, unfortunately, were in, uh, incarcerated in jail for being who they are or were forcibly institutionalized. Many of these folks were isolated, thinking that no one else was like them, and all of them are survivors. I'm a gerontologist, so I love to talk about aging. So I'm going to give you just a little bit on aging. For the first time in the world's history, in the next five years, we're going to have more people age 65 and older than age five and younger for the very first time. So our world is simply getting older. And by 2030, in the LGBT community, 20% of us will be age 65 or older. I will be 64. I don't know, how about the rest of you? <laughs> Seniors actually represent the fastest growing segment of the LGBT population. And many of the issues that we've talked about this morning actually impact seniors greatly. Marriage equality is one of them, and we certainly saw this in the Windsor case. Not having access to Social Security survivor benefits, inheritance laws that disproportionately um, impact our seniors, uh, Pensions, medical spousal impoverishment, to name, to name a few, really thrust many LGBT seniors into poverty. And many of the seniors that we work with at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center were middle class folks who never thought that they would need to come to a social service agency for help because in their retirement they thought they were going to be continuing their middle class lifestyle. In terms of poverty rates, we see from another great study by the Williams Institute that lesbian couples age 65 and older have a 9.1% rate of poverty, the highest for any couples in the United States. Gay male couples over 65 have a 4.6% rate of poverty, and their heterosexual counterparts a 4.1%. Of those surveyed nationally in the first ever health study of LGBT seniors, 20% report living on $20,000 or less each year. And in Los Angeles, we partnered with our Department of Aging to survey LGBT seniors in the city and found that 22% of our seniors live on $999 a month or less. That's just not enough money to live successfully in Los Angeles. Nationally, LGBT seniors have a very high rate of living alone, and we know that for all seniors, living alone correlates with isolation, depression, disconnect from community. Nationally, the rate for LGBT seniors is 55% living alone. In Los Angeles, it's 65%. And when that was partnered, that information was partnered for us by a study out of University of California, San Francisco, 
that those who feel lonely, those seniors who feel lonely or isolated have a 45% greater chance of dying than those who still have social connection and do not have feelings of loneliness. That meant very clearly for us that we have a huge problem in dealing with isolation issues with our seniors. LGBT seniors also face <coughs> barriers to health care. And Jay spoke um, very eloquently about the healthcare issues here, so I'm not going to go over that too much. But uh, you should note that there was a great study done in New York where two thirds of doctors either gave or knew of substandard care given to LGBT senior patients. And Thomas Blank did a wonderful study in 2000 that showed that gay men who were receiving prostate cancer treatment were not asked about their aftercare. They were literally given a surgical procedure and then sent home without their doctor knowing what their aftercare was going to be. Other issues that impact our seniors are isolation and stress due to high rates of caregiving um, for loved ones, higher rates of reported disability, particularly for lesbian seniors, barriers to care and services, chronic stress with keeping a secret, and oftentimes prolonging an illness because of the fear of going to a provider of care. So that's all pretty gloomy. I hope that's not what we're all going to look forward to, because um, there's a lot of things that are actually going on right now. Currently, the LA Gay and Lesbian Center and SAGE have fairly robust senior programs. Uh, in LA, we provide services to about 3,300 LGBT seniors. And as many of you may know, SAGE now has the only publicly funded senior center for LGBT seniors. We're both doing really wonderful work, but unfortunately, we're really just scratching the surface. We do work in coalition. Um, SAGE, the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, uh, Center on Halstead is a huge supporter as well, uh, and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And we have worked to codify uh, the National Resource Center for LGBT Aging into the Older Americans Act, which will actually help us to continue to provide research and resources to folks all across the country who are working with our elders. In addition, we worked uh, with Representative Linda Sanchez to write and introduce the Social Security Equality Act with 100 co-sponsors last year. And groups like the LA Center are working, of course, locally as well as statewide to ensure that departments of aging are creating plans and programs for LGBT seniors. Finally, we know that we must work with mainstream providers of care. Um, these coalition groups are really incredibly important. The National Resource Center for LGBT Aging, as well as the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, um, Boulder's Project Visibility, the Center on Halstead, have all embarked on training programs to ensure that mainstream providers of care have safe spaces for LGBT seniors. One of the reasons that I got involved with aging issues is I worked in campaigns for a number of years, and one of my volunteers, an elderly gentleman uh, in his late 70s, was becoming more and more frail over the course of the campaign. And one day we sat down and had lunch together, and he said he feared that he'd no longer be able to care take care of himself, that he had lived the first 35 years of his life in the closet, and he feared that the last couple of years of his life, he was going to have to go back into the closet when he moved to an assisted living community. And that's just simply something that we shouldn't put up with. So our work is starting to make headway, um, but we're really just starting on this long journey. And your help really can make a difference in the lives of LGBT seniors. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of our elders. Thank you. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room um, are not seniors. I can't really see very well from here. Um, but um, let me address you very briefly with two words of uh, recommendation. If you are not seniors, keep trying. Kathleen Sullivan has described to us uh, the continuing growth of our senior population in both numbers and percentage. She has focused on the need for services for the elderly, especially those whose economic resources are stretched. And she has mentioned steps that are being taken today to address those needs. I'd like to speak to those matters from the vantage point of my own experience as an aging gay man 
who has worked on issues affecting the LGBT constituency since I moved to San Francisco in 1977. Incidentally, apropos of what Matt Foreman said, um, there are hundreds of philanthropists uh, in San Francisco, all of whom seem to be related to Levi Strauss. All of you probably have heard stories about the time when homosexual acts were criminal and people could be jailed, lose their jobs, or be denied housing merely on the suspicion of being gay. Bars and bathhouses patronized by queers were routinely raided and customers whose names appeared on police blotters might also find them in the newspapers the next day. And when I say queers, that was a very strong pejorative word until we made it not so. Doctors and psychiatrists treated LGBT patients as mentally or emotionally sick. Lobotomies were performed. We were sissies and dykes and freaks to the world of entertainment. No wonder we hid. No wonder we drank. No wonder we thought so little of ourselves. Gay men in particular were at the effect of their appearance. They tended to think that 30 was the age of demarcation between young and old. Given that mentality and the double lives people led, there was a sort of self-fulfilling expectation that being old was synonymous with being alone. What a tragic world we created for ourselves. It has taken two generations to get beyond our self-negation. And even today, gay men in particular tend to think of themselves as objects in some kind of contest of appearances. Until recently, there was no place for the LGBT elderly to go for care and companionship. We really have no idea how many have been residing in facilities where everyone was presumed to be straight and where the attitudes of the past prevailed among the staff as well as the residents. Um, in, I think it was 1979 or 1980, um, a group of about a dozen uh, gay men went to Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco, which is a very large uh, facility uh, for the elderly. Uh, it was Christmas time and we dressed as elves. And uh, our, um, our appearance alone sort of gave away our sexual orientation. <laughs> Uh, so as we went from room to room, uh, I, I happened in on a gentleman who was, I believe, 101 years old, uh, who had been a resident in the hospital for many years, and he had tears in his eyes, and they were not the tears of age. They were the tears of recognition, and they were the tears of a sense of camaraderie that I'm sure he had not felt since he entered that institution. That's the way it was in, in 40 years ago. I'm very proud, incidentally, of, of, of my uh, alma mater, Swarthmore. There was a member of the board there who um, came to me uh, and asked uh, what I knew about the needs of uh, LGBT seniors because he wanted to start, he was in the business of operating senior centers and he wanted to start a residential facility for gay people in Pennsylvania where there were none, where there were no, no facilities, there were lots of gay people. <laughs> Although we're finally beginning to address the special needs of our brothers and sisters, there's much more to be done. The work of SAGE and the LA Center and other community organizations 
is not only providing services, but also building awareness of the special challenges that often face LGBT seniors. Outreach to elderly individuals can be difficult, and it becomes especially complex when those individuals are still closeted in the environment of their past. I've been very fortunate in this regard, and uh, um, at the same time, I find myself facing a separate issue, which is generally known as ageism, uh, because my partner, Michael, is very much younger than me. And uh, we have, uh, I think, had looks askance at us from various resources, including family, uh, and we're dealing with that. And I hope very successfully. Um, I'm deeply in love, and Michael is here, and he's here with our with our baby peanut. And uh, um, I hope I'm not embarrassing you, Michael. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. On April 10th, the Institute on Aging will sponsor a conference in San Francisco. The first, to my knowledge, in a series titled LGBT and Aging. It's encouraging to see that our issues are drawing mainstream attention. Kathleen has aptly pointed out that the need for services will continue to grow in both size and complexity. As LGBT funders, we can both welcome this attention and support our seniors in realizing for themselves the fullness of life. Thank you. And for our final panel of the afternoon on global and international challenges for LGBT, please welcome Sally Tiam from None on Record and Jay Babalata from the Australia Foundation. Thank you. It is a tremendous honor to be here to share this space with such amazing activists and advocates. My name is Sally Chum, and I am the founder and executive director of None on Record, Stories of Queer Africa. And what we do is we document the stories of LGBT Africans on the African continent and also in diaspora communities. When I started None on Record in 2006, there was a tremendous silence around the experiences of LGBT Africans. I um, mean, I'll share a personal experience as to why I even began this project. In 2004, um, a lesbian activist from Sierra Leone, her name is Fanny Ann Eddy, she was brutally murdered in the offices of the Sierra Leone Lesbian and Gay Association. And the details of the murder were horrendous. Um, and at that time, I'm a Senegalese American lesbian. I was living in the United States. And it was the first time that I would see the face and the story of a West African lesbian in the news. So it had such a tremendous impact on me and I wanted to know what were our stories? What were we experiencing as LGBT Africans? And so I began collecting um, these stories because I wanted to make sure that for the future generations there wouldn't be that level of silence and isolation and loneliness about our histories and our experiences that I was experiencing as an African LGBT person. So what I learned was that you know, on the continent and in the diaspora we have been pushing for so long for visibility even at the risk of being harmed. Um, as far back as Beverly Dietze at the first Pride March in Africa, and even more recently, you know, with the murder of David Cato in Uganda after he was outed in the newspapers and also spoke very visibly about the, the realities of LGBT Africans there. So I wanted to you know, create something that would shift public perception. So when I started in 2006, I started alone and went in, with a mini disc recorder. And now in 2013, you know, we have two offices. We have a staff, we have an office in New York. We recently just opened an office in Nairobi where LGBT activists there are learning digital tools to document their own stories in the five countries of that region, which include Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. And just last week, we celebrated our 300th story, which is a tremendous feat for us 
because in the beginning we could probably collect 10 stories a year. Um, so what, what we have s seen in these stories is a lot of what has been talked about you know, the last couple of days of this conference. People are suffering with healthcare issues. Transgender Africans are suffering tremendous violence, whether they, when they're picked up and incarcerated, you know, by their families, et cetera. There's economic issues with employment. We also have a tremendous issue with media. Media, some African media, is oftentimes used to out Africans. So these are the sort of things that we're facing. I've been very blessed to do this work. Um, of, you know, it came from the, the death of Fannie and Eddie, the murder of Fannie and Eddie. But it put me on a path where I've had the opportunity to really shape and be part of a group of Africans that want to shape, you know, media and story. So now, here we are now, um, six, well, seven years later, and we're thinking about what it is that we're going to do in that region. How, what kind of impact are we going to have? And outside of organizing with LGBT activists, we're beginning to really strategize and think about how do we engage people, whether it be religious leaders, um, whether it be policymakers, family members, around talking about LGBT issues. So we're going to start to leave our communities, our activist communities in the five African, East African countries, and really begin to take the risk of changing hearts and minds through the work that we collect. Um, I'm gonna segue a little bit to Bob. Um, you know, I, in 2006 when I began this work, uh, personal narratives, it was very hard to get people to see how that was an important, you know, investment. And when we came to, to Australia Foundation and said, you know, we'd really like you to support um, this work of collecting LGBT stories, they really understood the mission and understood the impact that we would eventually be able to have. And, you know, for that reason, you know, I'm very happy to share this, this stage with her. So thank you. I'm just impressed that you're all still here. Um, I'm the last. Uh, you can go out immediately after Tim closes. Um, hi, I'm Jay Babalota, and I'm the executive director of the Australia Fo Lesbian Foundation for Justice. Uh, you can call me Bob, and you can call us Australia. It's very important that we have as complicated <coughs> names as possible. Some of you know us intimately, while others of you are likely to just be hearing about us for the first time. I'd like to think of us as the little shop that could or the little shop that does. Uh, Estrella is the only philanthropic organization solely dedicated to funding LGBTQI activism both in the US and internationally. We're it. We've been at it for 35 years. We were the first and we remain the only. Um, it occurs to me that this is actually a story of firsts, right? This whole outgiving theme sees the day. Don't sleep. This is an unprecedented moment. We are bearing witness to a radically unique time. This is a singular moment. Here's our street cred. Internationally, Australia has awarded over $9 million to over 345 organizations in 81 countries around the globe. Nationally, Australia has awarded over 11.3 million to over 1,000 organizations and individual artists in 43 of the United States. Australia prides itself on often making the first grant to nascent groups. Internally, we talk a lot about what it means to make an Australia grant. And so when I came on board as executive director almost two years ago, I asked, what do those numbers really mean? What story do they tell? And sort of dis full disclosure, I came to Australia um, with a 20-year career in, grant in uh, filmmaking. So uh, the narrative was critically important to me. Upon reflection, we gleaned these four organizational pillars. Grant making, Australia is a grant maker. Australia is the first funder to hundreds of LGBTQI groups, and we are the largest public funder of LGBTQI organizations in the global South and East. We've made the most number of grants in the global South and East, and we're in the top 10 dollar amount, and we're the only public foundation on that list. We are committed to capacity building and leadership development. We produce and disseminate media and communications, and like everyone else in this room, we understand a basic tenet of our organizational work is philanthropic advocacy. Because we believe social justice happens when our combined perspectives, experiences, and resources are in the room. 
Australia also finds it critical to, our, uh, uh, to illuminate structural funding gaps that exclude our communities because collectively we have the power to eradicate these differences and grow our resources. That's who we are as an organization. We, pro we broke down our programmatic work similarly. Human rights, changing laws, political education, monitoring police and government practices. What do these have in common? This is the work that Australia grantee partners around the globe are doing to ensure sexual orientation and gender identity human rights protections. Programmatically, we're also committed to movement and network building. An important part of our work is to develop and foster alliances and relationships at the local, regional, and national levels. These interconnections lay the ground for sustainable global movements and widespread social change that prioritizes the needs of LGBTQI communities. We are dedicated to supporting arts and cultural advocacy. Australia supports activist artists and cultural change agents because we value their power to transform society by speaking up, offering true, diverse images of LGBTQI people and motivating us all to continue even in the face of incredible odds. Our fourth programmatic pillar is called Mobile Global. It's here that Australia works to keep our grantee partners connected. We build regional and cross-regional relationships that break isolation. Often, the issues of uh, lack of safety that we face are because we are isolated. It is under this rubric that we also respond to international emergencies. You can see these pillars at work uh, realized in our work with Selly and the folks at None on Record. We've made six different kinds of grants with them. We have worked collaboratively, uh, collaboratively as partners. They have grown. They now have offices in New York and Nairobi, as has their impact, and they're now able to work with our network of grantee partners as we facilitate the sharing of skills and strategies, ultimately so that we can all live safer and stronger lives. This is one story of our work onto some other firsts. What we see happening at the national level is what many folks in this room have worked tirelessly for. The legal recognitions of the lives we're already living. We demand that our public lives, our citizenry, be predicated on our actual lived human experience. And I mean that whether we are talking about marriage equality, economic access, immigration status, elder care, access to health care, et cetera, right? We're all in agreement about that. Australia is a public foundation, which means we raise all the funds we disperse. And as a result, we're a multi-stakeholder institution. We sit in the center of a constellation of all of our grantee partners, our individual and institutional donors, and our colleagues. It means that we work in the service of a public vision and that we see a core part of our charge as making certain the conversations that we have as community remain as nuanced as possible. I've stated that Australia, Australia has been supporting our movements for 35 years. About halfway through, we realized we needed to take that global. We began funding internationally because we understand our issues, our lives, and our conditions are inextricably linked. How could we talk about global economy, global trade, shared and interdependent natural resources and environmental conditions, but not also adopt a global human rights framework? We realized we had the capacity and responsibility to do so. We had the unique ability to connect the dots between the work our people are doing on the ground in the U US and the work LGBTQI folks are doing worldwide. And so we did. 16 or 17 years later, so did our federal government. In December of 2011, President Barack Obama directed all US departments and agencies working abroad to, quote, ensure that US diplomacy and foreign assistance promote and protect the rights of LGBT persons. Following, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton stated at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, gay rights are human rights. Two firsts. We, with our well-trained ears, understood the President and Secretary of State were boldly making a commitment to foreign policy and therefore foreign policy resources. 
And suddenly, there, this window existed, a window where what we had been considering a practice of radical philanthropy actually had the opportunity to parlay into participatory democracy. It was a moment to seize. But first, we had to jump out of that window, and we did. And luckily for us, we landed on a lesbian. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't an obvious move, and I, I want to be clear about this, that um, Australia is committed to funding internationally, whether we were working with the U.S. government or not. And I personally um, wasn't necessarily ready to walk into an organization and hand over the lesbian nation to the feds, right? Like, that wasn't necessarily the first uh, agenda item. But we saw this as, in fact, um, a continuation of the democratic fight we had uh, been witnessing on a national level. And we began to ask ourselves if we didn't see this conversation to fruition, who would? So the Department of State in the United States Agency of International Development began seeking partners who actually had the expertise to bring these declarations to fruition. We began a year-long process with USAID, which culminated in the creation of a multi-year initiative it's called the Global LGBT Human Rights Partnership, maybe a simpler name than all the other ones. This collaboration is a groundbreaking initiative. It is the first effort by the United States federal government to invest in and address global human rights inequities faced by LGBT people. And it is a partnership with the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice. Yeah. We know that criminalization, violence, economic exclusion, and social isolation continue to threaten the lives and livelihoods of millions of LGBT individuals from around the world. Globally, LGBT people face discriminatory laws and policies in 82 countries. We face the death penalty in seven countries. We suffer from employment discrimination, violence, and social exclusion barriers to civic and political participation, and it is no surprise that there's a dearth of development resources to augment these issues. The partnership is a three-year multi-million dollar initiative. It is a one-to-one -one match. We recognized it as a moment to seize. Some of you in this room joined us in that partnership and realized what a huge undertaking uh, it would be for us, even just infrastructurally, let alone politically and psycho-spiritually to engage uh, in, in the partnership. And I wanna thank the Gill Foundation um, for really coming to us, being one of the first people to come to us um, and uh, support us in, making, in helping make that match, but also recognizing um, uh, that we would also need infrastructural support in order to hold this space for all of us. Some highlights of the partnership are strategic grant making, uh, country-level data and landscape analysis in seven targeted countries. We'll be convening human rights activists and technology experts so that they can co-create innovative communication tools and have the opportunity to coordinate their communication strategies and efforts locally, nationally, and transnationally. This has never been done before. It also includes groundbreaking research by the Williams Institute, who I think might be the most named um, group in the, uh, throughout the arc of out uh, outgiving. Um, so big ups to Williams. Um, they'll be doing a study on the impact of exclusion of LGBTQI folks on the global economy and conversely what the impact on developing economies is um, once there is inclusion. It also includes a collaboration with the Victory Institute to increase the political participation of LGBTI people in select countries. Ultimately, Australia's ability to aggregate resources and leverage expertise has allowed us to be the, part, the architects of a partnership with incredible potential and integrity. As Sally made mention, it is our, the, our individual lives and stories are inextricably linked. 
none on record is able to prosper and grow because we exist in a symbiotic relationship. We're surely not their only supporter, but we do truly consider our, ourselves to be partners. And as we grow, and as um, our reach expands, and that we understand that the work that we, exi that we do in Brooklyn is relevant and informed by the work that is happening in Nairobi, we look to um, uh, you all to also make those connections. It is uh, uh, deeply inspiring to be in such incredible community and to think of the exponential reach we can have once we understand ourselves to be connected. So I'm grateful um, that you all were willing to uh, sit through uh, another two hours till I got here. Um, I'm happy to um, talk with you afterwards if any of you will be at breakfast also in the morning, if any of you have any interest in discussing uh, international work and how you can be involved. And I wanna thank uh, all of the Tims um, for having us and for creating such a, an incredible space where we can uh, connect the dots and know ourselves to be so inextricably linked. Thank you. Thank you.